history of this sound. Gravity in one strong body, gathered here in the struggle and the power, spirit drawing. Gathered here in the mystery of this sound, gravity in one strong body, gathered here. The struggle and the power, spirit of the here in the mystery of the sound. joining us. We also thank the people who are joining us on Zoom and at a special broadcast at Crondelet Village. We thank you all for joining us on behalf of the Basilica of St. Mary's, the Basilica of St. Mary's Immigrant Welcome Ministry, the Sisters of St. Joseph and Consociates, and the ICOM community. We welcome you here to this special vigil this morning. But on behalf of all of us on the planning committee, welcome and thank you for showing up to support immigrants and refugees this morning. With that, I'm gonna invite Sister Egg Foley to come up and do a land acknowledgement. Good morning. We begin this vigil this morning with honor and respect for the land and for the first people of this land. We are on the ancestral homelands of the Dakota people and we recognize their caring for our common home. Other sovereign American Indian nations, including the Anishinaabe and the Ho-Chunk, also have a long history with these sacred lands, past, present, and future. We are on stolen land. The forced removal of the Dakota people is part of our complex history of colonization, genocide, and broken treaties which impacts our relationship with our American Indian sisters and brothers. In our commitment to social justice and to the love of the dear neighbor without distinction, we know that these words are inadequate, imperfect, and are a beginning. Please consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today as we commit to uncovering the truths, listening, learning, building relationships, and advocating for and with American Indian nations for a more just world for all. Good morning. The ICOM mission statement is as follows. ICOM action in solidarity with immigrants and refugees to achieve justice 
and stand up to systems of oppression. The Interfaith Coalition on Immigration is a group of people of faith and of no specific faith. ICOM recognizes the sacred humanity of all people. Our diverse faith traditions teach us to welcome the immigrant, refugee, and asylee sisters and brothers with love and compassion. Dignity, not detention. The Interfaith Coalition on Immigration engages in courageous spiritual multicultural action in solidarity with immigrants and refugees to achieve justice and stand up to systems of oppression. We gather to stand in solidarity with our immigrant neighbors who are in detention and face deportation. We also gather to show our opposition to federal immigration, ICE policies that dehumanize our neighbors and separate families. We typically will hold vigil at 7.30 in the morning on the second Tuesday of every month in front of the Whipple Federal Building. We wholeheartedly invite you to join us in that endeavor as we bear witness in immigration court and provide assistance to families through ICOM and aid. Gathered here among friends and neighbors, let us cry out for all who seek safety, all who desire a home in these lands. <laughs> Discrimination. 
retaliation against the undocumented. May their hearts be turned toward welcome and community. And may their minds be opened to the gifts that each newcomer brings with them. Let us cry out for many who were lost, the many who have died along their journey, toward freedom and asylum, and for all who mourn and grieve the loss. This, this wisdom comes to us from the World Day of Peace message of Pope Francis. Migrants and refugees, men and women in search of peace. The wisdom of faith fosters a contemplative gaze that recognizes that all of us belong to one family. Migrants and local populations that welcome them and all have the same right to enjoy the goods of the earth. It is here that solidarity and sharing are founded. When we turn that gaze to migrants and refugees, we discover that they do not arrive empty handed. They bring their courage, skills, energy, and aspirations, as well as the treasures of their own cultures. And in this way, they enrich the lives of the nations that receive them. We also come to see the creativity, tenacity, and spirit of sacrifice of the countless individuals, families, and communities around the world who open their doors and hearts to migrants and refugees, even where resources are scarce. And now let us take time to hear personal stories from among us. We've invited four guests to come and share their personal stories of immigration and refugee experiences. So we're going to invite Vina from the Immigrant Law Center of Minnesota to start us. Thank you, Marty. Thank you, ICOM. And thank you to the sisters for having me here today. I stand before you as both a, the uh, executive director of the Immigrant Law Center of Minnesota, but most importantly, I stand before you today as the daughter of immigrants. 50 years ago, my father immigrated here to Minnesota in order to attend the University of Minnesota. Importantly, for about a century before that, it would have been nearly impossible for my father to immigrate legally to the United States because we had such exclusionary immigration laws that folks from Asia were virtually banned from coming into the United States, let alone naturalizing. But in 1965, Congress implemented the Immigration and Nationality Act, 
the statute that is the basis of our immigration law today. So in 1974, my father packed up his bag, came here to Minnesota to study engineering. He thought that one day he would go back to India, but that wasn't to be. As soon as he graduated, he got a job in the University of Minnesota. And because of that time, um, and because now we have an employment-based immigration system that's part of our immigration system, they sponsored him to become a green card holder. At that time, he thinks that it took him maybe a month, maybe a couple of months to become a green card holder. Frankly, he doesn't even remember because it wasn't that long. Right now, if a Indian citizen is working for an American company and be, is being sponsored by a green card, if they apply today, it could take over 20 years for them to get their green card. That doesn't even speak to their children who may have moved here maybe when they were two years old who have lived here their entire lives, but because of the way that our system works when they turn 21, even if their parents' visa petition is pending, they might not be able to keep status to stay in the only country that they call home. A couple of years after my father became uh, a green card holder, like all good Indian boys, he went home and he got married to my mom in 1974. They got married and about a few weeks later, my father came back to the United States, but my mom didn't have her visa yet. And as all of you who have been newlyweds know, you obviously do not want to be separated by, from your new wife right after you've gotten married. So because my father was very frustrated with the U.S. immigration system, which at this point had taken about mm, a month, um, he had every one of his U.S. citizen friends write to uh, uh, sorry, Senators Mondale and Humphrey in order to speed up my mom's visa application. We still have this letter that those wonderful statesmen sent to our family saying that they had looked into the issue and that yes, Mrs. Iyer was on her way. In August, 1974, on the very day that President Nixon resigned, my mother came into the United States as a green card holder. <laughs> Two years later, my father decided to become a citizen. Frankly, it wasn't an easy choice for him because as for many of you who know, who have decided to become a citizen of another country after you have grown up, have been born in another one, it's really hard to decide to give up such an important part of your identity that often has to happen when you become a US citizen and have to give up your citizenship. But my father did it. Did he do it to vote? Not necessarily, he wanted to. Did he do it because he knew that he had to be a part of this country? Actually, no, he did it for his family. He did it so that he could ensure that his parents could come here and be reunited and grow up with me and my brother. He did it so his brothers and sisters could have opportunities here. And more importantly, so that his nephews and nieces would have the opportunity to become what they've become today nurses on the front line of COVID, a prosecutor for the for the U.S. government down in Texas, a, my brother who's a consultant and has done work for various political campaigns, people who are contributing to this, to this country that we know today. At that time, in 1980, after my father became a citizen, it took six years for my father's parents and brothers and sisters to come to the United States. Today, for the for siblings who are Indian citizens to come to the United States, it would take over 20 years. Can you imagine being separated from your brothers and sisters, your nieces and nephews for 20 years, not being able to spend birthday parties, graduation, all of those things that make our family life a family life together. That is what the night one of the many things that is wrong with the 1965 Act. The 1965 law was absolutely an improvement on what we had before. But 50 years later, just as we have a decrepit transportation system and highways that don't work, that don't work from the 19, from 1960s and 70s when they were first built, the same is true of our immigration system. And frankly, my family had it easy. My father came as a student and then as an employee. He wasn't an asylee. He wasn't a refugee. He was not escaping climate change. 
think about how our system works for those folks. That's why we have to change our system. We have to fix it today so that families don't have to wait 20 years, decades to be reunited so that they can spend their families, their time with their loved ones, just as my family got to do. Thank you. We are free to be. So tears are seen and tears are shed. We are free to change. We are made. So now I'd like to welcome Sam from Temple Israel and the American Refugee Podcast to share his personal story. Between 1880 and 1920, over 2 million Russian Jews emigrated to the United States. That's a span of 40 years, 2 million Jews came to this country from Russia. Now, in the midst of that span, the United States tried to ascertain why that was happening. So the United States dispatched an immigration inspector in 1906 to Russia. And in 1906, that inspector found that the Jews had suffered relentless persecution. Now, why was that? So in Russia, the May laws had forced Jews to relocate to an area called the Pale of Settlement. I'm sure many of you have heard of the term, the Pale of Settlement. Not only were the Jews forced to reside there, but they were forced to live in confines that made it difficult to survive, but even worse were the pogroms. I'm sure everyone here has heard the term pogroms. We know that to mean organized massacres, but in Russia, the pogroms were state-sanctioned murders of the Jews as they forced them to live in what were essentially Russian ghettos. So the Tsarist army would show up in the middle of the night and drag Jews from their homes, burn the homes down, and massacre Jews in the streets. And that's why two million Russian Jews came. And that's why my grandfather came. So in 1906, as the US immigration inspector was going to Russia, 1906, was the year in which my grandfather came. They worked 16 hours a day walking the streets of New York City selling shoes. They lived in a tenement in the South Side that was probably no bigger than you know four of these tiles, right? This is supposed to be about a personal immigration and a personal refugee family. So here's my personal story. I'm not a refugee. I was born in Washington, DC. I'm proud to be from the United States. I've never been to Russia. My grandfather would not understand my life today. My great grandfather, who I'm named after, could not understand my life today. My life today, I get upset when I walk into Starbucks and my mobile order isn't ready, right? So we heard an incredible story about what parents have done for their children. My story is about what parents do for their grandchildren who they'll never meet and their great grandchildren who they'll never meet. Uh, as part of the American Refugee Podcast, I get to travel all over the United States and tell stories of migrant families and migrant communities, the struggles that they make, the sacrifices that they make are for their grandchildren. And I'm living proof of that. Thank you for being here today. We are bound to get when we are sharing. We are free to be both in our city and in our sharing. We are bringing change. We are making. 
Now I'd like to invite Krish, who is the CEO of Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services, to share her story. Thank you so much. Good morning. Um, my name is Krish or Krishanti Omera Vignaraja. I am the um, CEO of LIRS. I think many of you probably experienced this with me going from, you know, before it was 5G or 4G. It was dial-up and Juno. So I remember the first internet search I did, you probably aren't as self-centered as I am, but I typed in my first name, Krishanti. And still today, if you do this, the top hits that you will get are a story about a girl who was in high school in Sri Lanka. She was on her way back to school. She was part of the religious and ethnic minority, and she was stopped at a military sentry point the soldiers detained her, they gang raped her, they murdered her, and they butchered her. They dismembered her, and then they buried her in a grave. And when her mom and her brother and a neighbor went looking for her because her father wasn't alive, they were also killed and dismembered and buried in a shallow grave. So that was alternate reality one for me. My parents in Sri Lanka were part of the ethnic and religious minority. And so they knew with two small children, they had to get out of the country, however, whichever way they could. So the only country that would allow us to seek refuge at that time was Nigeria. So my parents, because they were teachers, they got jobs there. They had their bags packed plane tickets in hand to move to Nigeria, to northern Nigeria, where of course they didn't know the 276 girls would get kidnapped by the Boko Haram simply for going to school. That was my alternate reality too. But my uncle uh, was a doctor. He moved to rural Texas. He was the oldest of 10. This was a heyday of immigration. And so he had sponsored the family, hoping that at least some of us would be able to seek refuge here. And lo and behold, just before we were about to travel to Nigeria, our visas came through. We moved when I was nine months old. My parents came with no job, two little kids in their arms and about $200 in their pockets. Uh, my dad began when we were living in a basement uh, of my aunt and uncle in New York, um, they started putting together little widgets. I was, as I said, nine months at the time. I did my part because I would bang on the widget boards because they were shiny and I thought they were cool. Uh, they very quickly got jobs. My dad became a Baltimore City public school teacher. Um, we were adopted by that uh, apartment complex that allowed us to move in. Uh, neighbors became babysitters. The superintendent of the Baltimore City Public Schools uh, actually found us a basement apartment we moved into. Churches and temples put winter coats uh, on us because we had never seen a, a drop of snow. Uh, my father uh, retired at the age of 80 a few years ago, oldest public school teacher in the state of Maryland. I'm not sure I actually would have gotten him to retire, but for the birth of my daughter, uh, she was born that June, and that is when he retired. Uh, he believed, I said, look, I'll give you another full-time job. She's a handful. So I was worried that September that he might come out of early retirement, but uh, I think he would say that he got the best job um, he's ever had. My mom, uh, she had me when she was 42. She got her PhD when she was 62. My brother um, actually went to school with Bina. Uh, both of us went to Yale for undergrad. He went to Harvard Law. Uh, was the president of the Harvard Law Review. Because he's not here, I can brag about him. Um, he became a uh, clerk to Justice Breyer on the Supreme Court, uh, became the Attorney General of Maryland. And for me, you know, as a daughter of educators, um, I went to Yale and Yale Law School, Oxford on a Marshall Scholarship, and have the honor of a lifetime serving in the Obama administration as senior advisor to Secretary Clinton and Secretary Kerry, and then Michelle Obama's policy director at the White House. I have a four-year-old, which is probably my most uh, important contribution uh, to this world at this moment, but I know that my daughter's life will be easier because my own parents' lives were hard. And to me, that is the American dream.
Clarkson from the Basilica Immigrant uh, Welcoming Ministry, Support Ministry. I think my uh, immigrant story is a bit more typical of many of the people that are in the audience this morning. Um, this is a picture of my great, great, great grandmother on my mother's side. and. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about her, but first I wanted to go back to the land statement and just say for thousands of years, this homeland was really the homeland of the Dakota and Ojibwe people. But by 1858, by Minnesota statehood, nearly all the native lands had been ceded by previous treaties. What's truly tragic is not just their displacement forced migration, but that we took their culture and for some their spirit, which was so totally tied to the land. Today, if you want to drive down Franklin Avenue towards Cedar, you'll see the encampment, the native encampment again. The folks are literally on the median uh, that divides Franklin Avenue. They're living in tents there, and some are living under the bridge. So this is the effect that our displacement has caused for them. My great grandparents, I found out, were actually of Austrian and German descent. They settled on and started, uh, I think started really the community of Buckman, Minnesota around 1882. My great uncle Pete ran the only bar in town. This, Glenn is holding, is a picture of my great grandmother, Julia, and I was saying to Donna before, I look exact. I look exactly like her when they took the Costco picture, and I had <laughs> had my hair done. I was shocked. Um, her portrait hung in the hallway of the house where I grew up in Brimar. Um, This was my actually my parish when I was a kid. Growing up, my grandparents spoke German at home, went to school with the mass in German. My grandmother, Rosilia, middle name was Kunigunda. Uh, she was born on that feast day. My grandmother hated the name and didn't divulge it until I was adult. An adult didn't really try to find out. My grandparents were born in the late 1800s. Once married, they only spoke German when they didn't want my mother and my aunt to understand what they were saying. My mother said she understood it, but when we were in Germany, that wasn't the case. I was raised on sauerkraut and spare ribs, homemade bread and desserts, and I always envied the kids who came to the Basilica. And, uh, you know, I had regular bread, you know, and all that we had was grandma's homemade bread. I've lost my notes and probably lost my mind with it. Um, <laughs> There, were always a, there was always a large garden in my grandparents' backyard. Grandma camped for the winter months, just like she did on the farm. If you had asked me when I was a kid what my nationality was, I would have told you that I was German and Irish. Other Europeans settled in different parts of Minnesota. And I think it's worth noting that by 1896, Voting instructions were offered in nine different European languages. So much for English only. That said, it wasn't until 1924 when Congress enacted the Indian Citizen Act that Native Americans were made citizens. And, you know, I, I really do find this shocking. However, states were given the right to regulate voting 
in some states barred Native Americans until 1957. And we thank our four speakers for sharing their personal stories and inviting us to think about our personal stories. And at this time, we're going to invite all of you that are able to encircle the sculpture. And as we do, take in the images that you've heard, the images in the statue, take them in, look into the eyes of the refugees depicted here and their experience. Now we invite you to turn to a neighbor, someone standing next to you, to share a piece of your family story. We're going to give you four minutes, so two minutes for each person in your pair to each share your personal story or what you're taking away from this morning. So turn to a neighbor and share a bit.
We always have a call to action, but before we get to the call to actions, we know as my partner was sharing, this is very heavy. And so we have also three wonderful guests here this morning, and we're going to share the wonderful work that their organizations are doing and the challenges they're facing right now as they assist immigrants and refugees and asylum seekers here in our country. So we're going to start again with Dina from the Immigrant Law Center. Thanks again, Marty. 
As Marty mentioned, um, I'm the executive director of the Immigrant Law Center of Minnesota. For those of you who don't know, ILCM is the largest provider of free immigration legal services, education, and advocacy on immigration issues in the state of Minnesota. We are based in St. Paul, but we also have offices in Worthington, Austin, and Moorhead, Minnesota, in places where, as all of you, all of you know, immigrants have enriched um, the communities that were frankly dying in the 1990s and um, 2000s. Um, at ILCM, we have been working hard throughout the pandemic um, in order to serve clients. Um, although we are not, uh, our physical offices are closed, um, we are doing scheduled meetings with clients, representing folks in court, um, and going to immigration interviews for people to get their green cards and their um, citizenship. Right now, there are a couple of things that we are, of course, noticing. One is that detention numbers are up. For so long during the pandemic, detention was going down, but we are seeing more folks detained here in Minnesota. And particularly, we are seeing people transported from the border up to Minnesota, folks from all over the world who might ha not have connections, have family here in Minnesota who are being detained at EO High and at other facilities and who um, are really, um, I think, really, really thankful um, for connections to attorneys, but also to, I know, several of you and others who do visits in detention facilities and people who are keeping their spirits up. The second thing that we are seeing, of course, uh, is just the uh, all of the anxiety on limbo of our DACA holders. Um, ILCM is the, the, the largest provider of free DACA services here in the state of Minnesota. Um, as you may know, there are about 5,000 young people here at Minnesota who have DACA and several thousand more who are either currently eligible or who become eligible as soon as they turn 15. When um, the Supreme Court decision came down and DACA applications started to be accepted again last fall, we were all so thrilled and we had tons of folks um, who were assisting, volunteering in order to assist uh, young people to apply for DACA for the first time, which they hadn't been able to for several years. But unfortunately, as a result of the decision down in Texas, those uh, the adjudication of new DACA applications has stopped. And of course, DACA is, is the future of DACA is, is certainly questionable uh, because of these court cases. We are hopeful of winning. We think we should win. But the fact of the matter is, no matter if we win or not, DACA is limbo. The final thing I wanted to note is that we do the, the things that you can do here locally in order to work on this, because I think Chris is going to talk more about federally. Please, please, please contact your elected officials, especially here at the local and state level, about immigrant positive policies. One, if you live in Hennepin County, in Ramsey County, in St. Paul, in Minneapolis, all of those entities are providing um, financial support for organizations like ILCM, Advocates for Human Rights, others that provide legal assistance. Please let your elected officials know that you want that to continue. Second, this is the time to meet with your elected officials at the state level about policy changes that need to be made during this legislation. Driver's licenses for all must pass this year. You can do this. Contact your friends and family and we can do it together. Thank you, Vina, and thank the Immigrant Law Center for the great work they're doing here in Minnesota and surrounding states. And with that, we're going to look a little nationally. So, Chris, if you want to share a little what's going on with LIRS. Great. Um, thank you so much. So, um, who here has heard of LIRS? Okay, I am so happy. I rarely get that response. Um, all right, so I will keep this part very short. So, LIRS is uh, the largest faith-based um, U.S. nonprofit focused on immigration and refugees. Uh, we began in 1939 um, with refugee resettlement, but certainly have, have massively expanded. Uh, I am proud to say I'm the only uh, female CEO of one of the nine resettlement agencies. Um, I have uh, several of our um, key staff and a board member here, so I just want to quickly identify them. So Beth Nelson Chase um, here, Andrew Steele, and then Jang Ankesser from our board. Um, all of us are a resource, so please, please don't hesitate to ask us any questions. Um, I know limited time and you've been standing for a, a while, so I'll keep it quick. Um, the first
first two things I'll update you on are actually related to travels. Um, so last week I went to Fort Lee, the week before I went to Fort Bliss. So Fort Lee is in Virginia. It is where the Afghan SIVs are coming into the US. Um, this is an issue we care deeply about. These are the interpreters, drivers, engineers, security guards who worked alongside our US military. Uh, my, my father-in-law, my great-grandfather-in-law, my great-great-grandfather-in-law, all were Air Force. And though they're from upstate New York, I can't tell you which way they voted in the elections, but this is the one issue that my father-in-law and I agree about on immigration. Um, there are others too, but the question I get on this is why aren't we doing more? And why didn't we do it months ago? These individuals have been targeted by the Taliban. Uh, just last week, I published an op-ed in CNN talking about Sohel Pardis, uh, an interpreter who served for 18 months. So not enough time to technically qualify as an SIV because he had served for two years. He was on his way to pick up his sister to celebrate Ramadan. He was stopped at a military checkpoint. The Taliban dragged him out of his car, brutally beheaded him. This is not a one-off story. We know that it is the moral obligation that we have to fulfill our promise, which was we would not leave these individuals behind. But it's not just the right thing to do, it's a smart thing to do. The only way we fight that next war, wherever it is, let's hope we don't have to fight it. But if we do, the only way we can successfully do that is if we have local allies. The second fort that I visited was Fort Bliss. So this is the largest children's influx facility in El Paso, Texas. When I visited, they had about 1,200 children. I walked into basically a tent city. Each of these tents could keep up to 520 children. I visited Homestead under the Trump administration, and I can tell you that this dwarfed what I saw at Homestead. The idea of being able to keep 10,000 children on a military base is mind boggling. And what's behind this? Just two weeks ago, we saw that the operator for Fort Bliss got a billion dollar contract. We cannot allow for an immigration system that allows for profiteering off of detention. Just last week, when we were in discussions with the White House, this White House, they told us they renewed GEO ISAP. So GEO is one of the biggest private prison companies. They renewed their contract to provide case management to asylum seeking families. This is the nature of this system. This administration canceled private prison contracts but made an exception for those with DHS focus on immigration. We know that we've successfully been able to slowly pull out, push out private prisons from the domestic penitentiary system where criminal justice reform is not over until we stop the profiteering off of brown and black people. The third, uh, the third area I wanna talk about is refugee resettlement. So you all know this, I know the refugees. Under this administration for this fiscal year, we've only resettled 6,200. That will be the lowest of this refugee program since it began in 1980. And that's against the backdrop of unprecedented needs. 82 million around the world that have been displaced, 21 million refugees. And so this is where, you know, LIRS is proud that we resettled Congresswoman Ilan Amar. There's so many of these stories, right? So many of these people who are looking to come here, who have an opportunity, but we need to push this administration to do more. And then the final topic I wanted to cover was climate displacement. We all are experiencing it every day, day. And yet no country in the world recognizes the intersection of how the climate crisis is gonna impact the immigration crisis. We know that by 2050, 200 million people will be displaced. Whether it is those who had to relocate after Hurricane Katrina or individuals, Americans right now, off the coast of um, Louisiana, on Isle de Jean Charles, that are getting federal dollars to resettle now, or indigenous populations who don't get that funding, who are living in Shishmore of Alaska, they're losing their land. They have no place to go. And yet our legal system is antiquated and backwards. And so we have an opportunity because this administration did do an executive order, acknowledge this issue, and said that they would have an uh, a report published. It was supposed to come out this past week. LIRS published a report, we have an opportunity, we have a way to actually address these populations under the current legal system. We need to do more. This is where the US can lead the charge and now is the time to act. So thank you for hearing uh, us. If you wanna learn more about our detention visitation program, how you might be able to become a transitional foster care parent and provide
provide a home to these children if you want to be a part of our advocacy will action alerts and of course andrew would um kick me if i didn't say if you want to donate uh, please come up to any of us and we'd love to talk to you more thanks again for having us we're so excited that you could join us this morning as part of your, your tour of the Twin Cities area. Thank you for being with us this morning and for the wonderful work that LIRS is doing. And you've given Greg a prompt for the actions that are coming in a moment. We've got Sam, who's going to share a little bit about American Refugee Podcast, and then we're going to do our calls to action. Uh, many of you know me as the host of the podcast, American Refugee. Thanks. Um, Texas was invoked and climate change was invoked. So I'm going to completely switch up what I was going to say and leave you with a message of hope. Thanks to uh, Greg King and ICOM, I started the American Refugee Podcast telling stories locally of the shadow justice system at Immigration Court, of family separation and mass detention, and the United States deportation machine. But ultimately, the podcast gained a national listening audience and a national following. Recently, I went to Texas and I went to the border to place water stations in the heat of the backcountry brush because every night migrants crossing the border are dying of dehydration every night. And I was able to do the water station project with one individual, an NGO of one. They had a big truck, put water stations in the back, and he and I went out and placed water stations. And then when he had to go and actually get his second vaccination shot, he just tossed me the keys and said, here's what to do. And then I went out and did it by myself. And you realize when you're standing out in Texas and flat land in the heat, that it's not a committee meeting, okay? I realized I wasn't sitting in a committee meeting. I wasn't talking about action. I was actually doing it. What I wanna leave you with is that the action of one person can change the lives of migrants. I know a lot of people here listen to stories, go, wow, that's interesting. But I am telling you, you can get involved. You can do this. Actions of one, NGOs all over the United States and all over the world are getting involved and taking action. And it really is making an impact on saving lives, preserving lives, welcoming the stranger, and helping the United States live up to the ideal of what this country can be. Humanity is a stream of historical consciousness. And you've heard a lot today about history, but I hope myself and the other speakers, amazing by the way, can help you understand that immigration is not a story of the past, right? Immigration is the future. Our historical consciousness will continue and you need to be involved to impact that future. I am so grateful to be asked to speak here today. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have a few things to close out our video. Uh, Greg is going to give us some calls to action. Hello. Thank you, everybody. I'm Greg King. I'm president of the board of the Interfaith Coalition on Immigration. Just honored to be here today. I'm the son of an immigrant who also came in 1969 to go to the University of Minnesota. So we'll have to compare notes on that, <laughs> Bina. Um, as you heard today, and as we filled up our spiritual cup today to be inspired, there's a lot of work to be done outside of here. This practice is wonderful for us, but our voices and this spirit is needed right now in the offices of our elected officials, in their voicemails, in their email inbox, because there's very much a lot at stake Anybody who breathed a sigh of relief when the new administration came in should pay attention to the fact that whether it's refugee limits or how we treat people at the border or how families can be reunited, it's still very much in the balance. And we need you to reach out to your elected officials. You heard about DACA, which is again at risk. And you should reach out to your elected officials to say you need a permanent legislative roadmap to citizenship. So that it's not at the whims of a judge or the next president, whether or not people have a path to citizenship and whether or not these dreamers have a chance to build a better America with us. Our hosts here today, the Basilica and the Sisters of St. Joseph have provided two links where you can take legislative action easily. They will be shared to the ICOM mailing list. So if you go to mnicon.org and sign up there at the contact us page, 
we will send those links to you so you can advocate for DACA and advocate for a Build Back Better plan that supports a permanent pathway to citizenship. Quickly on the DACA as well, uh, the Basilica has provided postcards over at the table here. They're collecting postcards for DACA youth and the, and the DACA program. They're going to send any postcards we get with the statue when it goes to Washington, D.C. So if you have a free moment at the end, stop by the table over here and sign an actual postcard. And you can also do it online. So you can do it two ways. And we will send those out to everybody in our mailing list um, as well. We know we, to change this system, we need to change hearts and minds, right? If you're here online or in person, you're very likely on board, but there are many, many people who are not, who are afraid, who don't understand, who don't hear these stories. So there's two ways you can change hearts and minds and two opportunities. One, you can bring people right here. Throughout August, there are events related to this statue. There's an amazing and heart-changing exhibit from Green Card Voices in the, in the Basilica on the lower level. Um, they have a calendar of events at www.mary.org for Angels Unawares. Bring somebody who is unsure about this, who doesn't understand it. Bring them down there and let them see the, see the stories and see the sculpture. Also, at the State Fair, the great Minnesota get-together, our partners at Advocates for Human Rights have a booth. And they talk about immigrant rights and other wonderful things, LGBTQ rights, ending capital punishment, and many things that many people here care about. They need volunteers to work at that booth. If you get a partner, you can have the booth to yourselves for a four-hour shift. So sign up online at advocate, theadvocatesforhumanrights.org, and we will also send that link. Spend four hours at the State Fair helping other Minnesotans understand why this is important and why Minnesota the place that's better for the immigrants we bring in. And finally, all of these organizations, including ICOM, need your time to do our work. We simply can't do the events we do, the advocacy we do, or help the families that we do without volunteers. So we're looking for leaders to help in many roles, including right now financial tracking and communications. There is possibility of some pay for that. Uh, to learn more, contact us at info at mnicom.org. And of course, uh, we always take donations if people are willing to support these vigils. There's a basket up front. But Jim, thank you for hosting us. Thank you for being here. We'll sign up for the ICON mailing list. There are handouts with the calls to action on it. So if you didn't get one, uh, just look for Greg or for Rich. They've got copies there. And with that, we're going to invite Rich and Donna to come up and do our closing blessing. And the basket is going around for donations to ICOM Aid. Blessed are you, O oh God, so generous, so loving for us. Send us forth with eyes wide open, restored and refreshed ready for whatever and whomever you place along our path. Fill us with the courage of your spirit that our lights might build that much needed bridge for all who seek to call this place home. We ask this prayer in the one who calls us to be fully alive and let the community say, Amen. Amen. You gotta put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. Put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. You gotta put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. Put one foot in front of the other and lead with us. Don't give up hope. Don't give up hope. You're not alone. You're not alone. Don't you give up. Don't you give up. Keep moving on. Keep moving on. You gotta put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. Put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. You gotta put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. Oh, 
one foot in front of the other and lead with love. Lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes. Don't you despair. Don't you despair. Look up ahead. Look up ahead. The path is there. The path is there. Put one foot in front of the other. And leave with love, Lord, one foot in front of the other, and leave with love. You gotta put one foot in front of the other, and leave with love, Lord, one foot in front of the other, and leave with love, and leave with love, and leave with love. Thank you all and have a blessed morning.